Excellent. Everybody hears me? Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Tim. I'm one of the tech leads for Kubernetes. Uh, we were, when we were getting this all set up, uh, we were invited to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing with Kubernetes and runtimes uh, and this interface that we've been building inside Kubernetes called CRI. Um, I don't think it's going to be quite as uh, polished as Phil's. Uh, so I'm just going to talk. And uh, if you guys have questions, uh, please throw them at me in line. Uh, that's when I think it makes most sense. Um, we have uh, some of our engineering team here, too, who can also answer more detailed questions than me. Uh, so Kubernetes uh, is, a, is a container orchestrator system that was built on top of Docker, obviously, right? So we've been building on top of Docker for three years now, um, and we've sort of been part of the evolution of Docker from 1.1-ish until now. Uh, we've seen the good and the bad uh, along the way. Um, one of the things that uh, we that happens when you write software, anybody may be familiar with this, uh, it grows organically, right? And organic grown software doesn't always look very pretty after a couple of years of development. Uh, if you looked at our code base uh, a few months ago, uh, there were Dockerisms sort of littered throughout our code base. Um, it was very difficult for us to um, centralize and abstract that and to make sure that we had it correct. Um, we had people who were sending Kubernetes uh, pull requests to do things like add hyper or add other runtimes, um, and it was very difficult for us to sort of tease these things apart. Uh, we call it wiping the sauce off the spaghetti. Um, so um, Yuju, uh, one of our engineers here, took on the um, formidable task of really separating these things out. And so one of the things we had to do was this massive internal refactoring, uh, and we had to put a, a crystal API uh, between these things. It's the only way you make refactoring stick, right? Um, and so uh, this is what we call CRI. Um, unfortunately, you give anything a three-letter acronym, uh, and people think it's something bigger than it really is. Um, CRI is not uh, something that we expect users to use. Um, we'll talk more about it. Um, it's really an internal interface, so it's, it's really a refactoring of our, of our organic code. But it's also a way for us to say to everybody who wants to build a runtime, uh, that's great, do it yourself. You don't need to send us your patches, right? I don't want to be between you and your ship date. Um, so, uh, so, it's, so it's our plugin interface for runtimes. And we've broken it up into two. It is a gRPC interface, so to, to Phil's point. Um, we've broken it up into two primary interfaces. There's the runtime interface and the, uh, the runtime service and the image service. Um, today, all the implementations we've seen of it actually have these two services both served by the same endpoint, but it doesn't necessarily have to be so, right? So this, this split gives us a little bit of freedom in how we um, describe the way containers is going to run. So the presumed model here is that we have our kubelet, which is our node agent, which has a gRPC client, which talks to our gRPC server in what we call our shim, not to be confused with everybody else's shim. Um, and the shim then talks to whatever our runtime is. So today, the, the, the default implementation is our Docker shim, which is actually linked into Kubernetes, but we're still using the gRPC interface. So you can, you can do that in process. Um, and the Docker shim then talks to the Docker daemon over the classic APIs, right? And Docker Daemon obviously does whatever it does under the covers uh, and creates our containers. This works out uh, really well. In fact, it's going to go beta in our Kubernetes 1.6 release, which uh, launches next month. So, uh, so let's take a look then at what the API that is CRI. So for people who are not familiar with Kubernetes, we have this concept of a, of a pod. And a pod is a group of containers that work together very tightly. Uh, the classic example here is like a file puller and a file server. Right, I'm syncing content off of Git, and I'm serving it via my web interface. Like These two things have to run together. They share state. They share lifetime. Uh, they share um, you know, the, the content on disk. Um, and if they don't make sense to run one without the other. Right? Um, so we call that a pod, and that is our sort of scheduling atom. Um, and it's a higher level concept than what Docker offers. Docker gives us the primitives to build pods, but it doesn't offer pods itself. So pod sandbox is our high level primitive uh, in CRI, um, and it's really um, sort of an abstraction. We just say, this is the environment that we're going to run a bunch of containers in. We don't dictate exactly what that means for the runtimes, um, but we have some requirements around isolation, uh, like all of a pod shares a, ne a network namespace, right? So there, there's an, one IP address assigned for the whole pod. All those containers are running in the same net namespace. Again, Docker gives us the primitives for this. Other runtimes are left to figure out how to provide the same abstraction. Um, if you squint, it sort of looks like a little tiny VM, right? And it makes it actually really easy for people to take VM-based workloads and move them into containers, 
uh, without being forced to decompose them into microservices and without being forced to build sort of a mega Docker file. Um, so we think it's, it's sort of a nice uh, abstraction there. Um, one of the things that we're introducing now in Kubernetes 1.6 is a pod level C group. So we have an outside C group that it wraps all of the container C groups. And this gives us a better isolation. This is a technique that we use inside Google um, through our Borg system. Uh, and it gives us some better isolation and you get some really interesting semantics that you can offer through that. Um, that's not what I'm talking about today. And then uh, let's talk about networking. Networking is not part of container D, um, and, uh, but it is, it is part of Docker. But Docker has a really opinionated position on networking, uh, and over time that position has sort of taken deeper and deeper roots um, into the containers. And so one of the decisions we made last year with Kubernetes was that we were actually gonna go our own way on networking, and we we're gonna use a different networking interface because we had a different opinion. Um, and I think that's okay, you know, a year has gone by, we can revisit all these assumptions, but the state of things right now is we have our own runtime interface for networking. And what we didn't want to do was force that on every other implementation. So we said networking falls below this CRI boundary, which means every runtime is responsible for setting up networking how the runtime wants to. So you can imagine that there would be a more Docker opinionated runtime that built to CRI's interface that used libnetwork and the whole Docker network model. Totally in bounds, we haven't implemented that, but it's, it's legitimate. Um, so when we look then at our gRPC interface across CRI, um, one thing you'll notice is it's, a it's an imperative interface. Right? Kubernetes is a very declarative system. We like to talk about declarative as being the saving grace of us all. Um, and then we went off and implemented imperative uh, RPC interface here. Um, so RPC is sort of intrinsically imperative. Uh, gRPC is obviously derived from things that Google has been doing for a long time. Um, it makes a lot of sense to do it as sort of an imperative uh, interface, um, but mostly it gives us the ability to do a high bandwidth uh, connection between the kubelet and the runtime um, to be able to execute the things that we want to do. It doesn't mean that we're not actually doing a declarative system. The declarativeness is being done in the kubelet, which is responsible for reconciling through all these imperative commands what's actually happening on the system. Right? At the end of the day, there's, there's a turtle at the bottom, and the turtle is always imperative. Right? This, is our, this is our bottom turtle. So uh, one of the interesting things that we've run into through this process is, is logs. So CRI takes a position on logs, uh, trying to find a better way to, to deal with log management. Um, we have some features like log since that gives you the ability to scan logs from a certain point in time. Um, and so what we did with CRI is the API says, like, thou shalt store thine logs in this directory, right? Uh, and then you will, you know, if you store them in a particular format, then Kubelet can consume them regardless of which runtime you are. Um, we end up with a standard format, which means that all the standard tools work, which means you can use the Kubernetes command lines and UIs and everything else that the people that have, the tooling that people have built around Kubernetes. So uh, to look at the image service, uh, today we only support Docker images. Uh, we have really basic primitives, like we're, we're implementing CRI as an internal interface, right? So if you look at this from a, like a consumer point of view, it's gonna be very underwhelming because it's not very full featured. It does exactly what we need it to do and nothing else. So we have basic primitives, list images, uh, obviously get the status of images, pull image, remove. These are the things that are gonna map really well, I think, to the container D uh, RPC interfaces. Um, the work we're just starting now, again, our engine team is here, um, we're just starting now to figure out how our CRI interfaces map to the container D interfaces. Um, uh, let me talk about container D in, in a minute. Um, obviously, you can refer by name or digest the same as you can with Docker or container D. Uh, and uh, the only tie-in between the runtime and the image service is the runtime has to be able to consume whatever the image produces. That's it. So life cycle. So I, I mentioned pods, um, and I think the, the life cycle around pods is interesting um, because uh, we have this idea that when a pod lands on a machine, when it gets bound to a, a node in the cluster, the pod exists. And it doesn't matter if any containers are running or not, the pod exists. And containers can come up and they can come down and they can crash and they can restart and whatever the life cycle of those individual containers are, the pod exists. Until that pod is removed from the machine, it exists. And so this is reflected in our gRPC interface. Um, run pod sandbox creates the sandbox. It doesn't start any containers in it. It doesn't actually run anything so much. Um, 
but it gives the runtime an opportunity to do whatever it needs to do to set up the environment into which the remainder of the com uh, imperative commands are gonna run. Um, obviously, the opposite of run um, is stop, and stop frees up a bunch of resources from the pod, things like IP addresses that might be relatively sparse um, and that you wanna release back to the system, but stop doesn't actually delete everything, right? So stop leaves your logs, it leaves whatever history you have around your containers there, um, it just frees up the things that we might need to reuse on a relatively short term. And then remove obviously does the rest of the busy work and cleans it up. So now you've got your pod sandbox created, and now you can make any number of create container calls into this pod sandbox. Remember we said this is like a shared network namespace. This maps really well to the containerd model of being able to create a namespace outside the life cycle of any one container. Um, so now we can inject these containers into this network namespace, they will start up, uh, they will run, uh, here we model the, the basic Docker and container D APIs with create, start, stop. Um, nothing surprising there. Um, Kubelet is responsible for watching, like did a, did a pod crash? If it crashed, Kubelet has a restart policy, it has a back off counter, um, and so it implements all of the declarative, you know, you intended a container to be running, let me make it running, um, but it also implements all the sanity checking and denial of service, denial of service policy. Um, so the, the basic life cycle there, uh, run, create, et cetera. So to recap the CRI part of it, it is our plugin internally. It is not designed for general consumption. It is not a user-facing API. There may be command line tools for it, but those are primarily development and debug tools for it. These are not uh, things that we want end users to use. Uh, we are not positioning CRI as a Docker competitor. Um, if anything, it's, it's intended to be a very thin veneer over semantics of an arbitrary system below, yeah. I'm gonna say it on the mic. Do you expect to maintain the shims? Uh, does the Kubelet team expect to maintain the shims, or do you expect Containerd to implement the CRI? Uh, I think the shim is our problem. I don't think it's Containerd's problem. Now, in the long term, in the limit, we can figure out sort of what the alignment between these layers of the stack want to be based on consumption from users. Um, I don't think at this point in time there's any reason that Containerd should consider taking Kubernetes-based primitives into it. I, I'm a big believer in clean layering, um, and I think the clean layering here is at the primitive level that we've established with Containerd already. Um, so CRI obviously is built on top of Docker. It had to be built on top of Docker. It is, you know, by orders of magnitude, the market leader. It's the only thing that really matters. Uh, and so people are building, are using Docker, so we built CRI on top of Docker. Um, it is currently the default, and um, we're shifting to the, the um, CRI in 1.6 as the default implementation inside Kubelet. Um, but Docker did not always match exactly what we wanted to express through CRI. So some of the challenges that we ran into, I mean, the, the, the chain of calls to make a container is pretty staggering, right? Kubelet talks to our API server, which then talks, or sorry, API server to Kubelet, Kubelet to CRI, shim CRI to Docker, Docker to Containerd, Containerd to Run C, like debug that, right? S something went wrong. Um, it, it's sort of hard to find, right? Um, there's a bunch of bells and whistles that Docker has. Docker's been building um, an opinionated stack up, and I don't, I don't want any of that. It doesn't make sense for Kubernetes, right? Um, and the problem with building a stack up is, you know, the taller the tree grows, the deeper the roots have to be. Um, and those roots sometimes break my pipes. Uh, and so we've had some problems with this, um, and for when it comes to like qualification, it becomes a bigger and bigger task for us to qualify new versions of Docker, which break in new and interesting ways, um, or just introduce new, very subtle incompatibilities, um, and those don't bring us any value, right? Um, and then you know the, the whole OCI image support thing is is sorting itself out, so that's less of a less of a big deal these days. Um, when we looked at things like logs, logs is a great example of something that didn't quite match, right? The default. Docker logging policy is to decorate the logs in a particular format, which wasn't the format that we really wanted to consume, uh, and the logs are coupled to the container's lifecycle. And so we have this weird state in between stop 
and uh, removed that we have the containers laying around so that we can serve the logs, uh, but we don't really need the containers or most of what the containers are there. We just need to keep the logs around. And so um, the, the state mismatch there wasn't, wasn't great for us. We can't tell Docker, you know, go log your stuff in this directory. Uh, we can't, oh, well, I guess we can. We can write our own log driver, right, which we haven't done. Um, so for now, we're continuing to use Docker's JSON driver. Um, we use a bunch of sim links to sort of populate the logs in the place where CRI expects to see them, and we have this weird life cycle. And it's not perfect, but it works, right? Um, so this is where I think Containerd is, is great, right? Containerd seems to be a much better fit. It's a much lower level primitive than what Docker is giving us through the Docker API, um, which is exactly what we need. Like honestly, Containerd uh, could not have been designed better for what we want out of Kubernetes. It's, uh, it's all the parts we need and none of the parts we don't. Um, now obviously the system's still being fleshed out and, and a lot of the corner cases are being uh, smoothed, but I have, I have confidence that this is exactly what we need. Um, we don't have a tight coupling. Uh, we get all the OCI support. Um, we get to eliminate one hop. And honestly, after today's talk, the idea of being able to inject a gRPC plugin into Containerd itself is sort of tantalizing, um, that we could actually eliminate a second hop, right? It could actually literally be our CRI implementation. I didn't see that coming, so kudos for surprising me. Um, I'm a little worried about the Go 1.8 plugin support, honestly. It's, it's brand new, there's some things to shake out, but um, the Go team is smart, so I have confidence that it's gonna work well. Uh, so this is pretty exciting for us. Um, additionally, if anybody's ever used Kubernetes and run Docker PS on a Kubernetes node, half of your screen is filled with a container called pause. And this pause container serves only to hold the network namespace open, because that's the only way we can convince Docker uh, the software, not the people, uh, to, uh, to hold the namespace open for us, right? Well, OCI and, and RunC actually have the primitives we want, but they weren't populated all the way up through the stack. So now, as we're using Containerd, we'll be able to do, create a namespace, pin it with the file descriptor stuff, uh, populate it with our network interfaces, and then put containers into it without having to have one container that stays alive all the time. Right? It's, it massively simplifies our life cycle inside Kubelet, um, and it gets rid of sort of the biggest, ugliest wart uh, that has been part of the system sort of from the beginning. So I'm, I'm personally very excited about that. I'm gonna buy a cake the day we kill off the, uh, the pause container. I'm not even kidding. Um, so in the near term, very near term, uh, we've got uh, some engineers now who are spending time looking at container D, mapping it to CRI, figuring out how we can use it, um, making sure that, that Containerd has everything that we need to implement CRI, uh, and if not, we have to fill in those gaps. Um, and we're gonna be working on our proof of concept uh, CRI shim for Containerd. Um, one of the interesting things with Containerd is this promise that uh, Docker is built on top of Containerd too, so we could actually just drop Kubelet onto any Docker-enabled machine and just sort of reach underneath Docker and tickle Containerd and do our work without disrupting the rest of the Docker system. But if you don't have Docker, you don't have to use Docker. You can use Kubernetes and Containerd directly. And we don't have to worry about uh, going through the Docker stack and getting all the, the, the bits that we don't need. So I think this is a really great blend of, of what we need out of the system. Um, so once we put together our proof of concept, then we take it to our community. Um, anybody who's worked in the Kubernetes community knows that we like to uh, debate things. Um, and so, uh, this will be an interesting discussion with our uh, node-centric community about uh, the proliferation of runtimes and what we want to do about default runtimes and, and sort of what we're going to endorse as the best established way of doing it. Right now, Kubernetes, officially the Google team has qualified Docker 1.11, uh, which is six months behind. Um, and uh, at the, this point in time, we have not finished a qualification of 1.12 or 1.13. Um, in my ideal world, we never would. We would actually just do, do Containerd. I think this is a better answer for everybody. Um, then we can have a separate discussion about what it means for Kubernetes on top of Docker with a more opinionated stack, with the networking, with the storage, and all those other bits. Uh, but that's a separate conversation that we can have at a separate time. So the current status of CRI, uh, Kubernetes uh, right now is at shipping V1. Uh, so that was our alpha API. It was very, very much evolving. Uh, 1.6, which releases next month, uh, we'll be deprecating our uh, non-CRI Docker implementation. Uh, right now, literally our code has two full implementations of the Docker stack, um, of, of our shim to Docker. Uh, 
uh, and we'll be deprecating the old one and shifting everything to the CRI-based one. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of community-based projects that are building to the CRI interface, um, and I'm learning about new ones pretty much every week. Um, so this is obviously interesting to people. Um, a question that I anticipate to get is, uh, could we use Containerd's runtime plugin support instead of doing our own run? It's sort of weird when you look at it. Kubelet has a runtime interface, which talks to Containerd, which has a runtime interface, which talks to Run C. Um, and the, the problem here uh, is that uh, Kubelet wants to implement higher level concepts that need to wrap containers. So it doesn't make sense, I think, to be able to put it underneath, um, which is a little bit unfortunate. It would be nice if we could make the layering work, but I don't think the right, I, don't, I do not think it would be right to make Containerd learn about pods. Right? Pod is a very opinionated concept that Kubernetes has an opinion on, and uh, I just don't think it would be the right thing despite a long-standing Docker bug that I found. Um, I think we closed it. Um, so, uh, so this is the interesting layer. Now, I expect that this being a very creative community, we'll find somebody who runs Kubernetes on top of Containerd, on top of Vagrant or something, and it will be a weird Frankenstein thing, and I can't wait to see it work. Um, but I don't know what it's gonna look like. We'll see. Uh, this is it, this is the end of my slides. Like I said, my, they're not quite as fancy as uh, Phil's slides were. Um, but I hope that you have a sense of what we're doing with CRI and why, um, and more importantly, what it is not, right? It is not an attempt to define a new container. Questions? You alluded to the future where, you know, uh, CRI, I mean, uh, Kubelet directly talking to Containerd, right? Uh, and you're getting what you need and just that and not, nothing beyond that. But so how are the other things that Kubernetes relies on, like for example, where the images are coming from? It's still getting the images from a registry, mm -hmm. Rocker registry or something. So how, how does that picture look a little bit? Like there are still external Docker services that I you're mean, gonna continue to rely on? And Today when people refer to an image in Kubernetes, it is implicitly a Docker image because that's all we support. Uh, and we support the crazy grammar that Docker support. I mean, literally, we take the string and we pass it through to Docker, so we don't even try to interpret it very much. It's not 100% true, um, but we don't do very much interpretation of it. Um, and I think that's gonna remain true today uh, with Containerd. What's interesting, I think, with Containerd is the opportunity, the opportunity to uh, retarget um, what an image means, right? So one of the requests we get a lot from enterprises uh, is, I want my users to be able to say, you know, use Ubuntu, but I don't want it to pull from the upstream Ubuntu. I have my own qualified Ubuntu that we've tested and certified and we manage, and I want all my corp developers to pull from that Ubuntu, right? But I don't want them to have to say from mycorp.com slash blah, blah, blah. Um, and so this is a feature that's been sort of contentious in the Docker community because Docker wants to have sort of a purity of vision around what a string means or what, what an image name means. Um, which is really counter to what I think enterprises want in this sense. Um, so I'm looking forward to experimenting what we can do with the idea of these remotes um, and being able to sort of target that. Um, and then I, I think this will bring open a whole new world of things people can do with image formats, and not image formats, but, but registries and protocols and access you know, mechanisms. Um, the plugins uh, for registries are gonna be sort of fun to implement. Um, I anticipate already users saying they want to add ones dynamically, so just wait, just wait for that feature to come. Um, yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Uh, I had a question. Today, CRIO supports multiple uh, run times, right? Today, uh, CRIO supports multiple run times. So when we go to the um, container model, so uh, we will, uh, CRIO, then only talk to container D because we support a runtime for uh, CRIO. Right. So where would be a, a, a runtime provider fit in once you go, go into supporting container D? Uh, container D will become one implementation of CRI. Um, whether it becomes the default or not isn't 100% up to us to decide, right? This is where the Kubernetes community comes in. Um, but assume for a minute that you're that you, you have to build a cluster for Kubernetes, you get to decide what runtime do you want to put on your machines. Um, one of the things uh, that we aren't particularly keen to implement right now is multiple runtimes on the same machine. Um, it, I think that's a massively complicating thing and I'm not sure that it's worth doing. 
Um, so at the, at the moment, we've taken the position that you have a machine and a runtime, and you have to decide that. Um, so if you're the cluster administrator, right, you decide, am I installing Docker, am I installing Containerd, am I installing Rocket, or Cryo, or Fracti, or Hyper, or whatever, you know, uh, runtime you want to install on that machine. To the rest of the Kubernetes system, it doesn't matter, right? I'm just talking to my kubelet, and the kubelet is talking to the runtime, and the runtime holds all the details. So in this case, the kubelet will talk directly to Containerd and not to CRIO. The kubelet talks to a CRI endpoint. The kubelet doesn't care whether it's Containerd, a Docker shim, a hyper shim, uh, you know, some hypervisor-based thing that we can't yet anticipate. It's a CRI endpoint. So when you configure kubelet, you give it the IP and port of a, of a gRPC endpoint, and it's going to talk to that. And I and I hope and I believe that that thing will be Containerd in the vast majority of cases. For you know, for all the people who use Docker today, that thing should probably be Containerd. Um, but there's a long tail of people who want to do, uh, let's call it interesting stuff, um, that I don't want to be in the way of. Anybody else? So we're here. If you have more questions later, we'd be happy to go into the details of how things work or why. Uh, and um, I love to be challenged on 